Okay, so uh, good evening or good morning to everyone who uh, has joined us here today. My name is Aaron Greener. I'm the program director at the Albright Institute in Jerusalem. Um, and we're pleased to bring you a discussion and responses to Glenn Pierce's new book, Animism, Materiality and Museums, Byzantine. How do Byzantine things feel? Published by the Amsterdam University Press in early 2021. Um, so Glenn will introduce his book in just a few moments. And following his introduction, we have four panelists who will each respond uh, to this book. They're free to say whatever they want to critique the book, say what's good about it, what's bad about it. Um, and after that, Dr. Pierce will have a few minutes to respond to any of the comments that the panelists may have. So let me just introduce uh, Professor Glenn Pierce, uh, who is the author of the book. He is a professor at the Department of Art and Music Histories at Syracuse University and emeritus at the University of Texas at Austin. He's currently a fellow at the Clark Institute of Art, and he has been a fellow at the Hebrew University Institute for Advanced Study in Jerusalem, a Whitehead professor at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, and a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And he was also an associate fellow at the Albright Institute uh, just a few years ago. Uh, we actively encourage you to support, support the Albright in any way you can so that we can continue to offer you these free programs. And I'll, I'll provide several links uh, throughout the workshop. And now I invite Glenn to present his book. Um, thanks very much, Aaron. And um, thank Thank you, Matt, too, for the invitation for presenting, presenting this book. It's a great honor to be back virtually at the Albright, where I have a lot of um, yeah, really fond memories uh, of being. Um, I should also thank Andrea, Donato, Shannon, and Joe for agreeing to participate in this panel. It's a real honor to have them here engaging um, this work. I'm, I'm really grateful. I should also say that uh, my colleagues at the Menil Collection in Houston are um, yeah, always close to me when, when I'm uh, thinking about my work, and I um, I'm I'm deeply grateful to them for all of the support over the years. I should finally add my dean at Syracuse University, Karen Ruland, who provided funding so that this book could also be a um, an open access book um, for anyone who's interested in the question to to download. So my um, brief remarks today. So my, my brief remarks today are intended to give some intellectual and experiential background to this book, Animism, Materiality, and Museums, How Do Byzantine Things Feel, which was published uh, a couple of months ago now. It represents a still provisional statement of my own thinking about the vitality of matter in the Byzantine world, how we might understand historical objects outside Cartesian categories, and how we might allow such historical objects to speak, if not with their natural voices, whatever those might be, then in voices that are true and authentic to some of their meanings and work. My current work takes some of these insights even further into post-humanism, particularly the kind of media theory modeled by Friedrich Kittler and Bernhard Siegert. This model gives me a way to think even farther ahead of the animism book, if that's of interest to any of you, into areas where I argue that human subjects are the products of their art or things or media rather than just producers of them. But to provide some background to how I arrived at that methodological position generally, I want to describe some of the formative experiences I've had at the Menil Collection in Houston, Texas. This book really is the result of those long-term experiences, and I try to record both the experiences and some of the meanings I arrived at in the book. Now, the Menil is a museum where the art can very often speak for itself without the interference of signage and labels and photographing visitors, where objects and humans are encouraged in almost every possible way to engage in a mutual interrogation. I can say many other things about the collection, but the former Byzantine Chapel Fresco Museum fundamentally shaped my thinking and feeling. For my work on the materiality of Byzantine art, which is my specialization, 
and indeed the intuition on the vibrancy of that materiality that led me to my work on animism, that space totally remade me. It began with teaching, since I would very often bring students from Austin some three hours drive away. And the time in that space just got longer each time, deeper and more moving. Now, these reflections are also nostalgic for the Frescoed Chapel is no longer. It was rescued by the Menil Collection, restored, installed in Houston with the permission of the Church of Cyprus. The chapel was in place in Texas from 1997 to 2012, when it was returned not to its original site, it was looted on the Turkish side of the Green Line, but in a museum in Nicosia, the still divided capital of the island. So looking back in this way is both deeply pleasurable and profoundly saddening because that was a unique space for us to encounter and experience very particular conditions of Byzantine art. It was a space that showed something more distilled and more expansive in its framing of that art. That framing might be said to suspend or even suppress the art's attempt at expressing its place in a world on its own terms. But I would argue that the freedom given to it in that place allowed it to say even more eloquently and movingly what it could say even in its village context in the north of Cyprus. The chapel might qualify as an object out of place, a category of objects sometimes called by the acronym OOPS. And if that allows us to see and experience such an object in ways that challenge and undermine preconceived notions, then so be it. It's also a heterotopia, of course. It places the chapel in Texas and Cyprus simultaneously and in a mutually subversive way. And it is now always oops, since its divided self is kept in different places. And perhaps it will never resolve those heterotopic identities either. It's in a kind of utopia, a kind of no place that only exists in memories and on skin. I try to describe some of those skin experiences in the book in my own case, but not fully or perfectly anywhere now, really. The space then. Being in Texas, you enter from the parking lot, but you also cross a water channel on the left-hand side of the slide. So a kind of Buddhism, uh, another version of heterotopia, and you experience a building that is a concrete shell. It also encompasses a courtyard, a cloister, reminiscent of a monastic complex. What awaits you inside has to be approached with due preparation, and that necessitates moments of decompression in a vestibule where eyes and mind are readied. And this is looking up into the, the light well of that vestibule. And then the interior, a space quite unlike any other I've seen in a museum or historical context. The heart of the building was this darkened shell called an infinity box by the architect that was lit by natural light washing down the walls on the right-hand side and spots that focused attention on the outline of a chapel in the center of the space, as you can see on the left. The inner chapel is built to the same scale as the historical building in Cyprus, and it's both that solid entity and something phantomish for the housing of the fresco, of the looted frescoes. The Russian doll nesting here of a building in a building reveals the reliquary-like setting of, of, the, of the context. So criticism of the strong aestheticization and preciousness of the frescoes might be right, but it was also a consecrated space at the same time. Oops meets heterotopia again. The frescoes are placed in another frame, a structure of frosted glass and metal rod sutures. It was only when you went from the rim of the infinity box to its center did the infinity really open up to you. In the dome above, and only visible from that spot, in the very center of the chapel, Christ Pantocrator revealed himself at the almost end of time. While in the apse, an epiphany of virgin and child with archangels mediates that about to begin judgment initiated from above. The frescoes are the surviving portions of the original 13th century program, but beyond those orphans, we know almost nothing about the program patron, painter, or even the local saint to whom the chapel was dedicated. 
So this place was the catalyst for my project of trying to understand and feel the particular compelling, strange agency of things. There's special ways of acting on us and making us their own. The project also became a reclamation initiative since the chapel has multiple lives, only one of which intersected with mine in Houston. Here are versions of the chapels in Nicosia in the upper left, near Lisi, at setting outside the village of Lisi on the northern Turkish side again of Cyprus in the bottom pair, and in Houston in the upper right. There's more to be said, much more, I think, about the identities of these paintings across continents and military boundaries. But it's hard not to name that chapel in Houston as my own most formative experience for the book. It was here sitting with students and attempting to parse the stylistic and formal qualities of the paintings within that strangely medieval modern setting. And under that moving numinous glow in the museum space, it was here that the real surplus and life of art came to me fully, not to mention some of the ethical implications and demands of the place something that Morag Kersel, whom I first met from at my time at the Albright, has addressed recently in an essay in a menial publication called Object Biographies, which appeared a couple of months ago also. And it led to an ambition to make an argument for the life of objects, which I was able to realize to some degree with the exhibition Byzantine Things in the World that I guest curated at the menial in the summer of 2013. I wanted to try to argue further for the animacy and autonomy of Byzantine objects by letting them enter into a conversation with art that they would only encounter in the menial collection, not only American and European masters like Barnett Newman, Mark Rothko, Robert Rauschenberg, E. Klein, Willem de Kooning, but also non-Western art from Sub-Saharan Africa. So the idea in part was to find a way to express, not to imitate, I have to stress that, but to find a way to realize in a museum setting the intensity of the aura and life around objects like, or settings like, the icon of the Virgin of Sadnaya in Syria, which is on the left-hand side. I wasn't aiming for piety, not at all, but allow, allowing to emerge the autonomous and relational power in these objects that gave them their subject forming capacities. Though it hasn't stopped me from continuing to think and to write about it, I can say for certain now that my sense of control over the argument was and is uh, overconfident. One thing I learned was how much more the objects had to show, to teach, to reform me than I had imagined possible. And the exhibition book was only a provisional statement as it turns out. And therein lies the real reason for animism, materiality, and museums, to try to catch up with and recognize the lessons the objects were teaching me, all the while recognizing the excess they've mostly kept to themselves and will continue to elude me. Let me try to express these ideas briefly with one room only. This room was midway through the exhibition, and it had a memorable intensity. The eye catcher is The Halo, a work from 1985 by James Lee Byers in the center. And on the right-hand side, lower, are two polished brass orbs from 1967 by Lucio Fontana. But the real star, and I think this was borne out by other people, other visitors besides myself, is the small gold box on the left-hand side in the vitrine, dating perhaps up to about 500 and probably originating in the Balkans. I can't describe it at the length it deserves here. But the idea was to demonstrate in this room the mystery of vision, how some materials destabilize themselves, come alive and extend their reach and to their spread into all and within all entities in their orbits. And I use things purposefully as a way to indicate a horizontal world in which all these relational individuals, not individuals, but divisible entities, interact. The small box more than held its own, and that was the hope. And it only became clear just what kind of energy and relationality the box has when it began its conversations with these things that had not met before. The box merged, reflected, catalyzed the humans within its conversations. 
viewers also consistently tried to touch the gold and the brass in the room. There's something deeply charismatic about those objects. They also created their own environment. It was consistently colder in this room. And that ambient temperature was really effective, um, affected some people quite, quite profoundly too. And in the end, we were won over to their reactive, quiet life that felt us back in their ways that are so much more slower and more thoroughgoing than our own. The thingness of the box emerges from close description of the materiality and what materiality could mean in its original context. And it's an ongoing, it's a, a light motif of the book, certainly. Aesthetically, one can argue all cultures enjoyed the color and sheen of gold. Part of animism was to take seriously that culture's, that culture's idea of science, of how Byzantines knew and explained their worlds. So Orr's meanings in terms of historical geology are significant because this material was also understood, I argue, on some level as living. Water formed theory for gold was current during the period. It made sense because gold was mostly produced from alluvial deposits. And it was only common sense that gold was related to the element of water. And indeed as a kind of perfect earth blood, you might say, released from the planet from the planet's veins and put gold together with the human maker, the craftsperson, you get a mutually remade pair of subjects. Neither emerges unchanged and neither do those of us who come into their paths subsequently. In its remaking, the gold box shows that formative element in its viscous shimmer, a vacillation between its solid and liquid forms that museum display can reveal, although it often resists the temptation. And it also hints at some of the active lives such a thing would have had in its original context. Let me so say too, that this photograph does not evoke any of those points. The photograph is biased towards clarity and legibility and apprehensibility of the object it focuses on. You have to look beyond the photo on the screen, in fact, in order to imagine the point I'm trying to make. So in their characteristic ways, objects abstract themselves to a truer nature under varying conditions, live and photographic. Gold and silver reflect and absorb light, and they become expansive, open versions of themselves under activation. The objects lose their integrity, they lose their outlines, they lose their definition as integral things in themselves and enter then into relation, where integrity dissolves, transforming relation among objects and human subjects comes into play. The divine manifests in this very demonstration of geology. Taking things seriously is a good thought experiment, I think, and it's even better as an ethics experiment. If we take all things as they offer themselves, which is really hard to do for a variety of reasons, then we might get closer to a democracy of individuals. Individuals are the opposite of individuals or indivisible entities. Looking back on the book now, I'm a little concerned that the introduction is strongly or a little too strongly preachy, say. Um, I'm a little concerned about that, I'm, but I'm also wary of having to explain why Byzantine art history can matter. And a little alienated from that field that has tended to stay away from the ethical and progressive possibilities of study of this historical object and culture. I'm also wary of stressing too much the democracy of things to the point where equalization approaches a kind of neoliberal project of quasi rights for all without regard to difference and contingency. I try to address this danger in the introduction to the book, but I want to signal that I'm not satisfied with my own response still. As my colleague here at the Clark Institute of Art, Jennifer Nelson, has written in Disharmony of the Spheres, we need to stay clear of what she calls the classical liberal and neoliberal project of rendering all humans equal a project professing justice through guaranteeing individual freedom, but in practice, rewarding homogeneity and normalization, end quote. Granting objects rights does not make us more ethical scholars, 
when we continue to disenfranchise so many of our fellow humans, in short. So by way of an open conclusion, not, not in fact touched on in the book, but I just want to pose a question and, and see where it takes us. If things are alive, if you will grant me that much, can things also then have religion? I've been working on a project with a Syriac colleague, Bob Kitchen in Regina, Saskatchewan, about a verse sermon or memora delivered by Isaac of Antioch in the 480s about a parrot who spoke divine truth that convinced Isaac to adopt the, the animal position as orthodoxy. Isaac's a very open thinker. And while he comes back to the human side in the end, he enters into and entertains animal faith and indeed theology, which is what the parrot gave him. One of our categories of the human that we've guarded carefully is religion as a foundation of real culture, of a meaningful division between human and animal, and really between different stages and kinds of human too. To simplify religion in the way scholars and others do it, again, to simplify. It's a system of classification that relies on making distinction amongst thinking beings, of which the primary sign is language. Now we can guess some of the limitations of this model of religion, ableism, which denies some non-speaking humans full membership, slavery and colonialism, which likewise demote fellow humans. And where does it leave the, the animal then? like parrots and primates who have, I'll state, language and religion. And where does it leave this gold box again? What of the thing? It surely deserves consideration as a religious subject on its own terms and not just a religious object. If the terms include intentional movement towards and aspiration to union with the divine, those actions and hopes comprise their and our religious acts. Others would be included necessarily in more than a sketch as this is. And it's not just me saying so that those actions and hopes comprise their and our religious acts. Byzantines say, even if they didn't articulate all the implications of the position, that things worship God. To take perhaps the most important obvious example, a core concept in the highly popular theology of Pseudo-Dionysius is enosis, or union with God. And it was expressed as love, desire, deep yearning, zeal by and for God in relation to all creatures. Images and signs represent for weak human comprehension, the pure desire of God for unification with creation. Those material signs are more than guideposts for humans and are likewise pulled into their own irresistible tidal urges towards union in accordance with their relative complexity in the cosmic hierarchy. This Neoplatonism, so fundamental to medieval thinking generally, is a religion of things, I think we can argue, at least. And so the gold box once more and finally. Byzantine science, the physics and chemistry that also went by the name of alchemy sometimes, tells us that some matter moves towards perfection according to its nature, some slow, some fast, but all in different step from the human. Gold is already nearly there in on both the atomic and surface levels and its relation, its proximity, its setting, its mingling with other materials, two other materials, pulls everything in its orbit towards perfection. Thus, the way the gold box transformed with its own pace and processes, all the brass, bronze, and paint in that room in Byzantine things along with the human, in its purposeful, meaningful movement, the box practiced its religion. And as a social creature, it related to and altered its neighbors in the room, including all the humans passing through. So thanks very much for your, um, your patience in listening to my reminiscences about Byzantine things. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn. Um, we're now um, going to move on. And next up, we invite Mr. Loya. Loya is a PhD candidate in modern and contemporary art at the University of Texas at Austin. And the 2020-21 
Curatorial Fellow at the Visual Art Center. Previously, it was 2019 to 2020, Vivian L. Smith Fellow at the Menil Collection in Houston, Texas, which we've heard about before. And during the summer of 2019, he was a vid visiting scholar at the Academy of Media Arts in Cologne, Germany. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thank you, Glenn, for your presentation and for uh, um, sharing with us uh, uh, your very ambitious book. Um, I did uh, find, it, it is a work that really gave me a lot to think about and uh, uh, I used the term ambitious and I want to explain why I did, uh, I do find this work particularly uh, ambitious. First of all, uh, it's a, it is an attempt to look at Byzantine things, uh, not only with uh, uh, our own eyes, but also with the eyes of the historical communities that uh, created and originally experienced those uh, objects, uh, things. Uh, it is the term that, of course, we should use more. This is something that we could call the historian's uh, obligation, uh, being uh, true to the past without prejudices and without uh, projecting uh, too much of our hopes and desires onto previous historical times. So if we notice the subtitle of the book is not what do we think about Byzantine things or uh, Byzantine art, a term that uh, Glenn avoids as much as possible in his work, which is very interesting. And not even how do we feel about Byzantine things, rather how do Byzantine things feel? So this is probably the most ambitious scope of the book, in my opinion. So if we want to be true to the past and fulfill the historian's obligation, uh, what Glenn is telling us, we need to take the side of things. Uh, so uh, if I should try to capture this work with a motto, I would say this is precisely the motto, to take the side of things. Now, uh, what does it mean to take the side of things? And uh, I think there is a very philosophical ambition here. Uh, and this is why I also have been very much uh, inspired by this book, because I have a, a, a taste, a preference also for uh, works that are deeply philosophical. And of course, this is a work of an art historian. Uh, art historians are very much obsessed with the materiality of objects, that there are wonderful descriptions of uh, uh, artifacts, of, of, of Byzantine uh, uh, things, still to stick to Glenn's uh, 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 word choice. Uh, but this is also a deeply philosophical work. Um, why? Because to take the side of things means uh, to displace the human subject from a privileged seat, to displace the human subject from a privileged seat. And I am pretty sure that Glenn is telling us, both as a, an art historian and as a philosopher, that uh, if we do not abandon this prejudice of superiority, uh, one of the most cherished, the modern assumptions is that we human beings can be fully detached from the world. And it's funny that the, the pandemic is telling us uh, today that we cannot be fully detached from the world, uh, a world that we can pretend to control, administer completely, so if we do not abandon this prejudice, uh, we cannot understand or even ask the question, how do Byzantine things feel? So only in the moment that we have displa displaced the human subject from a pri privileged seat, we can ask this question. So now, which one is the argument, uh, the, the, the response that Glenn provides to this question, how do Byzantine things feel? Uh, Glenn already, he mentioned this uh, topic in his uh, little presentation today, but I want to reiterate this subject because it is true, it really permeates entirely Glenn's work, uh, which is the fact that uh, uh, Byzantine things were more than objects that waited to be seen by an external mind. When we are talking of Byzantine things, we are talking of not inert and passive uh, objects, but uh, um, agents, we might say, uh, uh, things with their own vitality. Um, so, of course, uh, 
now there is the incredible complex complexity, which is the big problem of this question, of this book. How do I address the vitality of Byzantine things? This is a incredibly complicated as a topic, especially for us modern uh, com historical communities at the beginning of the 21st century. So, I mean, first of all, uh, as uh, historians do, uh, <laughs> um, uh, understanding also the context in which these objects, they appeared, uh, and to recognize that they were born as part of an enchanted world. This is a term that returns a number of times, enchantment. So what does it mean that the world was enchanted? Enchanted. Uh, if I should use a motto, uh, the world, I will use this one. The gate was open. This is, I'm using an expression by the, from the book uh, from Glenn, the gate was open. We are talking of a dynamic universe, the field with the pneuma or spirit which pervaded the universe, a world with no distance, deprived of the Cartesian compartmentalization. Uh, what is the Cartesian com compartmentalization? That the body is here, the mind is there, then we have the world. Inside the world, we can divide it uh, in a different species, genres, we have things, non-human animals, animals, and so on and so forth. Instead, we are talking of a world that is, uh, um, to use another expression that Glenn uses, a, rela a relational system among agents. This is the way Glenn describes animism, a relational system among agents. What does it mean? It means that everything can be imbued with agency, not only human beings, but also blood, milk, stone, trees, gold. Uh, Glenn precisely spoke about gold in his little presentation now. So to live in a, an enchanted world means that the Byzantine things we lived in a world saturated by the divine, in which the passage from the mundane to divine, from the divine to the mundane, was a practical possibilities. Uh, and there are the parts that Glenn devotes to alchemy, for example, to the description of a topic called the prima materia, uh, which reflects on the permission of the spirit of God throughout the vastness of the universe that are incredibly clear and very, 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 very clear uh, to understand, very clear and to the point to understand this idea of uh, the vitality of uh, the uh, of the things. Now, uh, the problems. In the moment that we have contextualized, that we have understood the vitality of the things, the problems for us and for Glenn uh, are, first of all, uh, uh, how can we uh, let these uh, things tell their stories without our own verbalization? This is the first problem, because as we are doing now, today we are verbalizing, we are telling, uh, we are describing the vitality of these things. But what Glenn is telling us that is these things, they have a vitality independently from our own capacity or our own even desire to verbalize. This is the first problem. Uh, the second one is, which receives a great attention in the book is the museum. This modern apparatus uh, that is very good at preserving, restoring, uh, informing, uh, providing uh, didactic experiences, but in some way uh, it affects uh, the right of things, their own vitality. The vitality of Byzantine things is questioned by uh, museums. Uh, this is a uh, I will have I will have more to say about this topic, but uh, I'm afraid of uh, not. Uh, I, do, I want to stay in the time now. Uh, but this is I find it a very fascinating topic that hopefully we will be able to discuss more the role of museums for the existence of Byzantine things. Uh, but in a, in a nutshell, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a phrase, uh, what is the problem? The problem is that the museums favor the modern prejudice of a subject that can control an object of study. They favor distance. This is the big problem with museums. Um, I have to say that uh, Glenn is very uh, op optimistic, sympathetic about the possibility of using the museums in a better way providing experiences that are more empathic experiences. Uh, uh, but I think that this is a big problem. How do you respect the spiritual content and do not suppress it? This is incredibly complicated 
for museums. Even when uh, we try to uh, use uh, less canonical uh, exhibitions uh, uh, solutions, as Glenn did, for example, at the Meniel collection, it is still very complicated. And this is something that I very much appreciate in the work by Glenn. I think that he did it also today in his uh, presentation. There is no arrogance. There is never arrogance. There is the, the, the capacity of telling you this is very complicated. This is, he also shows us the problems of actually trying to show, to demonstrate, to let these Byzantine things uh, uh, animate us autonomously. It is very, it is very complicated. Uh, so uh, to, um, the problem with the museums is that they, they contextualize and they recontextualize as part of a, a, a modern uh, apparatus. And as part of this process, something is necessarily uh, lost. Um, the, probably the historical communities that will study us in 100 years, 200 years, with the hope that the world will still exist in 100, 200 years, uh, probably they will find uh, something like a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know how to say, like a, um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, paradox uh, contradiction in our way of approaching museums. On one side, we very much appreciate the work that they can do, that they can preserve and they can restore and they can uh, sustain uh, the life of uh, historical cultures. And at the same time, I think I always notice an element of nostalgia in our time. The fact that something is lost in the moment that an object enters, especially an object uh, from uh, uh, that is a non-Western or that comes from, uh, the, um, or that is an historical art, uh, artifacts coming from, uh, you know, a Byzantine world, something is lost. Uh, there is an element of nostalgia, which I notice also in the work of Glenn, who tries to use the, the, the museum in a, in a, in a more, um, how can I say, thoughtful way. Uh, so what is the final ambition of this work? If I should try to look at, uh, if I should try to look at, uh, at the final ambition, if I should try to capture uh, a final ambition, it is an ambition that goes beyond art history and even beyond the, 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 the secluded realm of, of Byzantine studies, which is also very exciting about this work. Uh, the, what is this uh, ambition that goes beyond art history? First of all, the claim that the world is more alive than we want to admit. The world is more alive than we want to admit. And then uh, in the moment that Glenn has done this claim, the second uh, ambition is, and what Glenn argues in favor of is a newly enchanted relation with our own world, a need for wonder. This is how I would say, a need for wonder. Uh, so, so now I will conclude because I think that I'm, I, I, I don't want to go over time, but uh, I am sorry that it is a book that gave me many things to consider. So I, I, I did want, I was trying to share as much as possible. Uh, a question that is for me an open question, is animism an historical category or a transhistorical perennial factor? Uh, this is very complicated, I think, as a, because at times I think that Glenn, he really wants to give us a more capacious understanding of the world in which uh, uh, it is a world that still is imbued with, with spirit, with spirituality. Um, uh, for us, Western uh, uh, scholars educated, but not only scholars educated, the simple fact of living in the modern West, is it possible for us to have an understanding of the um, of, of something spiritual of is it is it possible for us to go beyond the idea of a natural order that can be understand uh, with reference to something outside itself uh, this is very complicated uh, Charles Taylor the great Catholic philosopher so for example he says that the immanent frame has been the great invention of the West. Uh, so if, if this is true, uh, is it really possible for us today to experience or to even get closer to these animated things in their own animation? What I'm saying is that uh, uh, the idea of a self-sufficient order is it very much uh, um, uh, complicates our own appreciation of, uh, Byzant of, the, of the vitality of Byzantine things. So what, what I'm, uh, a question that is on my mind is, uh, is an enchanted world 
even possible today? This is uh, something uh, that is uh, that is a very uh, a big question for me. One might even ask: Is an enchanted world even desirable? Because this is also uh, another question. But um, I will stop here because I think I do not want to go over time. But uh, I, as I was uh, saying, this is a a work that really gives a lot to think about, and uh, it, it it has ambitions that go very much beyond also the field of art history. And this is one of the reasons why I've been so excited to read it. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Donato. And next up, I invite Dr. Mattiello for his comments and remarks. Dr. Andrea uh, Mattiello holds a PhD from the Center for Byzantine, Ottoman and Modern Greek Studies, University of Birmingham, and a PhD in History and Theory Performance Art from the School of Advanced Studies in Venice. He has published and lectured on a variety of subjects, the use of photography in the history of architecture, modern and contemporary art, performance, performance art, the agency of the arts of the queens at the late Palaiogen Byzantine court of Mistras and the cultural interaction between Greek scholars and the Italian humanists in the 15th century. So uh, please, uh, you may begin. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Aaron, for the introduction and Glenn and uh, for inviting me to take part in this uh, extraordinary opportunity to exchange ideas about your scholarship and your um, very inspiring research, I have to say. And thank you, Matthew, uh, who is in the back on the backstage, uh, helping us to uh, navigate this uh, Zoom reality that we all share these days. Um, the book. Um, animism, uh, materiality and museums, how Byzantine, do, do Byzantine things feel, as well as the exhibition, uh, Byzantine things in the world from which the book, as we heard, uh, originated. Uh, very stimulating intellectual exercises by my point of view. First of all, uh, because they courageously put the body uh, as at the center of the uh, discourse dealing with art, theology, and philosophy. Um, they offer both the exhibition and the book uh, a unique opportunity for uh, developing a better understanding of the singularity of artifacts pertaining to the Byzantine Orthodox tradition while enhancing their universality via convincing just acquisitions with modern and contemporary art. And that per se, is a, already a very important endeavor and enterprise for uh, an academic research project. Um, the book is a journey uh, using a multidisciplinary approach where different disciplines from art history, anthropology, semiotics, sociology, and philosophy come together to open a discussion where dialectically uh, we are offered different perspectives about artifacts that in appearance seem to be solidly defined by scholarship, but in reality are very porous and open for continuous and constant revaluations. And most of all, the book makes the point that it is exactly this constantly revaluation, which is the mission probably, ultimately the mission for the humanities. Um, most importantly, the research Glenn Pierce employs in the book and in, in the exhibition does not shy away from the centrality of the sensorial beyond the rationalized written realm. I believe this research approach particularly effective because it is dealing at the same time with art, materiality, culture, and religion of different time periods. Um, the book offers a complex contextual uh, collection of uh, textual, visual, and sensorial artifacts and sources as well, investigating the rich and the stratified and multiple nature that Byzantine art share with contemporary art and in their shared deflection from realism, uh, probably is due to the abstract nature. And this is a question that I have for Glenn already uh, at this point in my, um, inter my, 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 my intervention here. Um, 
I, what is the role of abstraction and uh, the abstractization of uh, artifacts of, Byz of the Byzantine world uh, in the process of conceiving your research project? Um, the selection of case studies discussed in the book offers a convincing lineup of dialectical juxtapositions where a Byzantine artifacts help to describe attributes of contemporary art and vice versa. Um, the focus on materiality is also very helpful. Um, it allows us to sort of break apart, break through, break from uh, the, um, the, the sort of stratified and um, sclerotic ways of describing uh, artistic production across the time periods. Um, the case uh, of the use of gold is particularly effective as already introduced to us by the presentation that Glenn used to open our uh, discussion. The 16th century gold reliquary, um, traditionally read within the specialized scholarship uh, on Byzantine religious artifacts, becomes the active force, almost the seed to inspire and renew the analysis and the study uh, and the comprehension of work like the, um, by artists like Robert Rauschenberg. And I think this works also the other way around. Um, contemporary art, the kind of research that has determined the work of artists working uh, in modern, modernist and postmodernist eras, find new and interesting opportunities of further and advanced analytical inquiries thanks to these sort of in dialogues between time periods and artifacts uh, to understand ultimately the role of the senses in relation to this recent um, visual and cultural experience as well as the visual and cultural experiences of artifacts from the past. Uh, by reading the insightful observation presented in the book, one can start a game of association where from the gold box by association one can diachronically relate to the work of artists like Duchamp, Yves Klein, Manzoni, Cunellis, Ronnie Horn, and the chain of association can continue. Um, and this is both inspiring, stimulating, and absolutely relevant for the promotion of the studies in the humanities. Um, the centrality of our senses, its universality and the role of the anthropic description and understanding of reality beyond the retinal art, that Duchampian description of the supremacy of the optical over the aptical in art making and art experiencing. This is at the core of the research that Glenn is uh, undergoing. And that allows us to put ourselves in a dialectical exercise toward both scholarship and the artistic production. Um, Glenn has convincingly kept together the Byzantinists uh, with 20th century theoreticians, which is per se already uh, an extraordinary achievement, uh, working in the disciplines that only apparently seem to be better suited for contemporary crit critical critique, um, when in fact that they can significantly contribute also to the study of Byzantine art that is generally subjugated to the predominance of logos over the anti-logos. But the Byzantine art uh, was, as we know, was touched not only by its makers, uh, but also by a multitude of individuals across time. And it was smelled, seen, kissed, and tasted and heard, its propagating essences cannot be fully described by words and reasoning alone. The ekphrasis is not enough. Byzantine artifacts and their true potentialities can interfere with infinite modes of interactions with the bodies they can potentially encounter. They are real, as real is the world they inhabited and they inhabit and that we inhabit and uh, someone in the past inhabited. The book and the exhibitions offer also navigation tools to map and navigate that world, this world, also allowing a sort of drifting uh, of free roaming in the world of now 
and the world of the past. And here, this is my, I have a second question for you, Glenn. Um, is there here any way that we can say that you, in a sense, touched that pharmacon that is embedded in the scholarship of Abi Warburg, in particular in relation to the pathos formal idea? Um, this, uh, both the book and the exhibit, allow us to encounter objects that, while pointing at different truths, are kept together in dialogue where a mutual comprehension develops. Their unique relevance is, ex is, um, uh, is it, it emanates, it presented to us for our senses. Uh, because probably, ultimately, our senses both and in particular for the Byzantine, for Byzantine art and contemporary art are the real object. The objects objectified us thanks to the curated exhibition environment and book uh, scholarship and the scholarship in the book. Uh, the objects in the exhibition and in the book, they generate uh, effects. Uh, they look at us and for each there are, uh, and also thanks to the curatorial uh, expertise employed by the Menil, uh, museum, um, they become process that we experience. And here is, again, there is an element that makes Byzantine art very much um, on the same level of contemporary art. There is a sense that uh, Byzantine art can activate our senses, our realities, our engagement. And uh, for sure, from the point of uh, the discussion of modernism uh, and the sort of the, uh, the breaking up of the authority of the author, uh, the role of the reader and the viewer uh, has become more and more relevant. And the capacity of the artist to activate the viewer is probably the most important contribution of artists still working nowadays. And here, my third question, uh, is there any way that we can trace a, a connection between your scholarship and the concept of relational aesthetics developed by uh, Nicolas Bourriot. The, exhibi the exhibition goer and the reader alike is allowed to compare potential emerging from different times and contexts, even in relation to what at first seemed like a damage, in a sense dealing with, again, with the Duchampian essence of the accidental. Our senses are enhanced by the curatorial practice that provides a performative environment, ultimately, that cannot be fully reduced by description and images. And here Donato beautifully explained just before me um, how limited we are by using words. Um, for instance, to fully corporally understand the role and the materiality of the color gold in a Byzantine icon or in a Rauschenberg painting, one really needs to be immersed in the sensorial emanation of those artifacts, to be in their presence, to be baptized, as you, Glenn, pointed out in the, uh, in the book, by their expanding forces. Things matter. Art, nature work on us. They force us to be aware, present, cognitively engaged in a fashion that is different from the authority of the logos in a sense for the, the authority of, as I mentioned just before, of the modernist authority of the artist. This allow for a greater democratization of our life experience. And I think Glenn, you are succeeding in pursuing that purpose. Um, and uh, the process of activate this democratic engagement as an extreme relevance in our times, especially in relation to issues like sustainability and the environment. And here uh, you mentioned in the, op in the introduction of your publication about the Anthropocene, this is the first time in the history of humanity when we can measure the impact we have on something that we, were con we consider as immutable and uh, eternal. But in order to make this engagement effective, there is the need for books and exhibitions like Animist Materiality and Museums and Byzantine Things in the World uh, to transform our knowledge and our pre-coded, often dehumanized understanding of reality, and ultimately allowing us to alchemically transform the matter of our thoughts and maybe the color of our skins. Thank you very much, Glenn, for the opportunity.
Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, next up, I invite uh, Dr. Steiner for her comments and remarks. Dr. Shannon Steiner is visiting assistant professor for global medieval art at uh, Binghamton University. Her research focuses on Byzantine cloison enamel um, and precious metal work with a focus on the intersection of Byzantine study of the natural sciences with practices of artistic production. Further area of interest include the role of the highly skilled craftsmanship played in Byzantine articulations of imperial power and the position of art making in Byzantine hierarchies of knowledge. Shannon is also a practicing goldsmith and incorporates aspects of historic technique reconstruction in her research and publications. So uh, please, uh, Dr. Steiner. Thank you so much. Um, of course, first, I'd like to give my thanks, um, especially to Glenn for the invitation to um, read a book that I was quite looking forward to reading anyway, and uh, giving me uh, the impetus to do it sooner rather than later. <laughs> And also um, to Aaron and to the Albright for um, allowing me to participate in this discussion. Um, I think first, it, uh, I too, like Glenn, have a lot of nostalgia for uh, kind of, or nostalgia surrounding this project, surrounding um, the Menil collection and the works of art there as um, a student of Glenn's um, and a recently hatched uh, professor of art history, I think that this project uh, concerning animism, concerning um, rehabilitating the lives and, and, and sort of desires of things is something, is very fertile soil that I grew in. And um, my own work uh, can't really be separated from my experience of learning to be an art historian as one was undertaking this project. Um, I think it's no uh, coincidence that I ended up uh, writing a dissertation about enamel, but also very much about alchemy. <laughs> um, so in the brief time that I have, uh, I want to address two facets of Glenn's book that I feel have um, an incredibly generative potential, um, both for the continued study of Byzantine art history as a discrete field, but um, also relating to the position of Byzantine art within the broader discipline of art history. Um, the first is, I think, what we've all been touching on here, um, namely the appro an approach to materiality that diverges from, I think, many that occupy the scholarly world uh, currently, in that it diverges from kind of rote iconology or um, approaching material as part of referential sign systems like semiotics or um, a sort of Panofskian iconology and iconography. Uh, I don't think that materials lend themselves well to uh, being considered as references to pre-existent ideas, um, but are essential to the generation of those ideas and to their circulation. Um, and this, mutual subjectivity that Glenn proposes in this book um, that democratizes relationships between humans and materials, it really does provide a more ethical framework to approach Byzantine art history. Um, and also I would, I would argue larger uh, practices of art history in general. Um, the second thing that I'd like to address that I'll get to in a moment is this problem that Glenn raises in the introduction of realism and what realism means in um, the study of art. And I think his positing of an alternate realism that doesn't depend on formal verisimilitude is not just possible, but is also essential to the study of Byzantine art and really pushes some of the boundaries of what we consider realism in art history at large. Um, to start with this intersubjective materiality, I think one of the most exciting things about becoming a medievalist and a Byzantinist in the time that I have over the last 10, closer to maybe 15 years, which is crazy, is uh, the sort of excitement surrounding materials and material-based uh, theories that has grown around medieval art. And it's something that allows some of the most forward visual and material aspects of medieval art to take precedence. So things like 
um, sumptuous appearances, uh, opulence and elaboration, abstraction as well, are all things that medieval art has been uh, marginalized for, or at least seen as somewhat deficient for a lack of focus on the conceptual and a, a embedded um, focus on the material. And approaches to materiality within medieval art history and Byzantine art history have started to recover some of those things. But I think they, as Glenn rightly points out, they continue this division of subjectivity in which humans are the subject and materials, the object, the object of study, but also the object of reference in their use as a symbol. Um, and that essentially things, both human and non-human are separated, um, materials being subordinated to human experience and cognition. What I think Glenn achieves by challenging that standpoint is a reclamation of the agency of matter and by extension um, for the objects various materials constitute. Um, it allows us to have a much more equitable discussion of the relationship between humans and the things they create. And the ethical vantage point of this position is really, I think, fertile and generative, especially as art historians and medieval art historians are attempting to bring um, a kind of political morality or ethics to our practice. Um, I think always when we talk about inner subjectivity and we talk about the lives of things, what things want, what they desire, the experiences that they have um, in which humans don't participate, this approach is necessary for recouping all of the um, sort of erasure of the livelihood of materials and things. But as some critics of recent approaches to materiality, particularly Marxist and communist critiques of materiality have put forth, this kind of elevation of things and of material often runs the risk of um, a kind of fetishistic um, concept of materials that is really only present in imperialist capitalist systems. But what I do think Glenn's vantage point does offer for us by insisting on the agency and um, really the, uh, the kind of ethical imperative that we recognize the agency of matter is that it allows us to also think about human beings who, are, who have not historically been considered human who have been slotted into the non-human. Um, and I'm thinking of course of enslaved people and um, perhaps other peoples who have been othered in the medieval world who are not allowed to fully express their desires, their wants and their experiences. And so Glenn's position in which he asks us to think more dynamically about the experiences and lives of things and matter allows for us to grant some agency and humanity back to people, um, to people who have never been considered human. Um, I'm going to sort of support that with uh, a couple of anecdotes. I'll share my screen briefly um, from the Byzantine world that I think make this abundantly clear, particularly as it relates to artists and art producers. So let me bring that up and hopefully this won't take too long. Oh, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> there we are. Um, I start with an anecdote from a letter on alchemy written by the Byzantine polymath Michael Pselos to the patriarch of Constantinople, Michael I Carolarius. In true Pselos fashion, you can never trust him. He is a uh, unreliable narrator, um, but also a master complainer. He begins the letter with a complaint, um, noting that uh, kind of calling his patriarch, his Lord, his soul sovereignty, but complaining that the patriarch has asked him to lower himself from loftier philosophical pursuits to a consideration of what he calls the lowly firecraft but also admitting, uh, albeit reluctantly, that this practice has elevated a philosopher to the knowledge of nature. And so he admits that the type of labor undertaken by human beings 
who do not who undergo manual engagement with materials is simultaneously something that is uh, lower in the hierarchy of knowledge than philosophy, but is ultimately imperative. It is needed to reach a fuller understanding of nature. And likewise, Salos later in his career was asked to be the prosecutor for the deposition of this patriarch. And while the patriarch died before he went to trial, Psellos' documents, his uh, prosecution documents still exist. And in those documents, he accuses the patriarch of practicing alchemy um, as a crime. And the crime itself is not alchemy. Alchemy is seen as um, a necessary way of understanding the physical world. Rather, the crime that Psellos accuses the patriarch of is the acquisition of goldsmiths from the imperial mint, um, which he then takes to his private property and compels them to create gold from copper. This uh, has a legal implication in that the patriarch has taken uh, imperial resources, that is the goldsmiths, from the mint without permission, um, and that his pursuit of alchemy is not for a greater understanding of nature or a love of learning, but is rather for personal profit. What compels me about this is not just that alchemy itself is considered noble, but reasons for pursuing it can be ignoble. It's also that the goldsmiths are not considered human. They're considered tools or equipment or other types of resources from which the empire can extract valuable skill and knowledge. And so Glenn's urging for us to um, consider the humanity of non-human things allows for us to look at human beings that the Byzantines considered non-human and to reclaim some of their knowledge, experience, feelings, and desires. And that I think from an ethical vantage point is essential given that many artisans in the Byzantine world, particularly imperially commissioned artisans, were not full citizens of the Byzantine empire in a legal sense, but were in fact enslaved peoples, peoples who were taken as prisoners of war, um, as sometimes as prisoners of war, particularly for their skill, um, as scholars such as Gunther Prinzing have pointed out in their studies of how artists are described. And so I think um, because we know that the Byzantine model of approaching artists is not anything close to the kind of Vasarian model of the individual genius, but rather are these unnamed and in many cases inhuman producers that Glenn's um, insistence on the agency of things and materials allows us to reclaim some of the humanity and actually redefine what it means to be human in the Byzantine world. I'm running short on time. And so unfortunately, I don't think I'll be able to get to my question of representation, but certainly if Glenn wants to bring that up in his response, um, I would be happy to talk more about it but it runs along similar lines. I think it was more important to discuss the ethics of this project, which I think uh, are something that makes it stand out from other attempts to re recoup medieval and Byzantine materiality. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, um, Shannon. And uh, next up, I invite our last panelist, um, Dr. Joseph Salvatore Ackley. Who is, an, who is Assistant Professor of Art History at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. He's a specialist in medieval metalwork and is currently preparing a monograph on gold, broadly conceived and precious metal object in the medieval West. He has published on church treasury inventories, late medieval figural scripture in silver and gold and the Carolingian artist monk Totillo of St. Gall. Okay, so um, Joseph, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm mindful of time and I want to get us to the discussion, so I will keep this somewhat brief. Um, thank you to the Albright Institute for hosting this gathering, and thank you to Glenn for inviting me to participate and for prompting me, therefore, to sit with this exciting and stimulating and beautifully written volume. Let me share my screen.
In my brief remarks today, I want to first discuss Piers' art historical method before introducing some objects into the mix just to see what happens. The main argument is especially intriguing and most timely, harnessing as it does the methodological consequence of the quote unquote material turn that has occupied art history, especially medieval and pre-modern art history for the last decade and more. Piers, cognizant of his position as a human speaker, seeks to get at things and to empathize and speak and even ventriloquize on their behalf. He begins this project by tackling head on with refreshing clarity and inspiring humility, what would seem to be the major barrier to such a task. Things typically cannot speak for themselves, or at least they do not speak according to the logocentric conventions commonly exercised by romantic and enlightenment era individuals, by modern individuals in a phrase. And therefore thing, they, things, must be spoken for which would seem to strip them of their agency and autonomy, reducing them to language, to entities commensurate with the human-centered worldview of modernity. Piers, however, levels the playing field between humans and objects by foregrounding their, our commonalities, and especially those, commonali those commonalities that language would seek to erase, omit, or forget. As he writes, quote, an object in a fully human world is a thing that has become known through its representation and thought by a human subject. However, in an animist universe, we are all quasi objects that share qualities of passive entities, but only superficially. In the ways we all act in the world, we are agents on an open relational plane, unquote. This recognition of human and thing alike as quasi object and agents on an open relational plane would still seem, however, to run into the same wall. A speaker is still needed, a modern human doing the filtering and the translating and the making commensurate. I recall the question Aidan Kumler poses to discussions of materiality and medieval art, namely whose materiality, as in who is speaking, for what purpose, and to what end. And it is here that I detect peers improving on and working past the seemingly obstinate blockage, namely by introducing an intentional humility and partialness to his thinking. For example, Piers notes, quote, perhaps I'm wrong in my imagining in the direction of my empathy, but I am not wrong to try. In this volume, I attempt to take the side of things and to occupy their perspectives as best I can. These fantasies are always provisional, partial, flawed, I have no doubt, but I am trying for a democratic homogenizing viewpoint where my human understanding is necessarily incomplete. While I model that failure, I also embrace the position that opens me and my body and mind to that, that searching, unquote. Modeling failure and highlighting the provisional and the flawed are quite exciting and most instructive. In this model, the excess of the thing, unknowable, nonsensible, but still agentive, remains. Furthermore, Piers notes the ethical and political ramifications of such provisional and incomplete thinking. Let me raise the possibility that not presenting our version of the past, quote, with an attitude of certainty and closure and leaving open interplay, imaginative and generous, among all the persons, visitors, and inmates could lead to fuller empathy with objects, feelings, and states than we are permitted normally, unquote. And finally, but there is hope in this position, hope that we can know better humility, see unfairness and act on it, sustain struggle. That hope is just an alertness to better possibilities, where we negate our anthropocentrism in favor of further opening subjecthood to all the disenfranchised and dispossessed, all the vulnerable, unquote. This is potent language, and in my reading at least, Piers acknowledges the stakes of his method, the traditional hurdles that normally attend it, i.e. the human speaker, the linguistic, and the way past such hurdles, that is humility and incompleteness and thereby openness. As splendid as this object is, after reading Piers's work, I cannot help but think that something has been lost in the Rauschenberg gold painting.
As forceful as it is in demonstrating, opening up, almost filleting and desiccating gold, here gold intertwines with canvas and modern picture frame applied almost like cake frosting and left wonderfully messy and textured, an explosive yet contained demonstration of what Bissera Pincheva and paraphrase might call the scintillating tremble of its fugitive state. And yet for all that high modernist examination of the medium of gold, I'm still reminded of a gold chalice. For example, the 10th century chalice of Bishop Gozelin, now in Nancy. This gold, and specifically its consecrated inner surfaces, was used to generate, to generate the blood of Christ, the flesh of a God. Church proscriptions were quite chatty about what materials were appropriate and inappropriate for fashioning the Eucharistic chalice, with gold, silver, and if necessary, tin being deemed appropriate, while copper, glass, wood, and horn for a variety of reasons were forbidden. The transformation of wine into godly blood is glorious and mysterious, and gold surfaces were called for. In pairing Rauschenberg with the Gozlan chalice in order to see differences, I worry that I may have inadvertently done the opposite of what Piers has modeled, but I don't think so, as such a pairing casts the gold of the chalice as something akin to a fertile, generative, and vital material, a reminder, as Piers reminds us, of the deep geological orientation of both the pre-modern cosmos and perhaps the post-human individuated conditions of our own cosmos today. Thank you, congratulations, Glenn, and I look forward to discussion. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Um, we've now heard from uh, all of our panelists or respondents, and I turn the mic back to you, Glenn, uh, to see if you'd like to just take a few minutes to respond to any of the comments or any of the questions uh, from your colleagues. And uh, I'll remind the audience, if you have uh, any questions, we have just a few more minutes, you're welcome to write them in the Q&A section. And um, Glenn and the others will have a chance to answer them if there are any. Glenn. No, thanks so much, Aaron. And um, thank you all for those really thoughtful and um, yeah, deeply, deeply engaged reactions to the book. You've, you've given me a, a lot to think about, but I'm also just deeply grateful for that, well, for spending time with, with what I've written. That um, I, I haven't had this experience before where I've been reflected back on through my written arguments and it's, 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 um, yeah, it's, it's moving and a little unsettling at the same time. Uh, I wouldn't take very much time because, I, as we've, we've said, we, we, we don't have very much um, remaining. But there are there a couple of points, maybe, you know, going back to, to Donato's points about the, uh, the enchantment of the world, which also played out in different ways in each of your responses, which was lovely. Um, and the Anthropocene as, as a condition within which we're, we're coming at our particular fields and questions of art history. You know, it, it is a, a constant negotiation of self-awareness where we can recognize the, the conditions of the Anthropocene, the, the oppressive nature of, of the results of our own actions. And that, that can open up ways to be more responsive, more, more um more aware in our own self relations to the world around us in a, in a daily uh, moment by moment way but it also um through that paradoxically allows us to see our own specialness as a category of 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 thinking ourselves capable of fixing the problem and that 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 sense of of both being available to to change and better relation and yet always somehow owning that better relation at the same time is open leaves us always prone to getting it wrong and that that's not necessarily an impasse although the anthropocene may ultimately um, be so but um it it simply allows a, a constant generative self-vigilance in our in our scholarly practice and, and our practice outside uh, outside of that and um 
yeah, even the um, that that sense of enchantment is deeply um, compromised now, and and part of the, the 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 recouping, I suppose, of this project has been trying not to find a pure time of of enchantment, although there is an element of nostalgia in this process, as we as we've all seen, um, but but to find to find a way around our own solipsism somehow in our in our scholarship and our in our ways of thinking which which are integrally connected to the ways in which we react to the world and and the people and things in it the the museum as as a site of that reparation is is it's an ongoing project and the menil has the potential maybe more than many places to be that site of reparation uh, I, I do feel optimistic at heart that somewhere like the Menil is going to, 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 to find better ways. It's not going to cure the world, um, nor is art, nor is Byzantine art history. Uh, but it is a way to prepare ourselves better. If, if it's not just comfort, it's also uh, equipment for, for thinking better about our position. So, you know, I, I do deeply feel the, the limitations of our museum contexts and the ways they condition our sensorial uh, lives, you know, with and without uh, historical objects. Um, but we can't, I, I don't see a way to live and to work without them now. Admitting the limitations is a way around the impasse always provisionally, always partially, always mistakenly, really. It's only, only as we move along that we, that we find um, provisional, provisional answers. The, um, yeah, Joe, your point about, there's so many things to talk about and I wish we did have more time and I, I don't really want to take um, uh, any more than maybe a couple of more minutes. But your point about the Rauschenberg, Joe, is just so, that, that is such a fascinating object. And, and putting it into that relationship and drawing those conclusions is really, um, really striking to me. The, the Rauschenberg, which is, which is small, it's something like 12 by 12. It's a small thing. It's hard to get a sense of the scale from the photographs, really. But it is oversized in the way the gold box is, and yet it's all it plays with authenticity and fakeness and representation, which is something I'd, I'd like to, um, if we have time for you, for you to come back to Shannon, if we could. Um, the sense of fetishization that you brought up, Shannon, was is is of course one of the 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 um, accusations of of this approach that we overinvest in in these historical objects; they become fetishes. But even just you know, thinking back through the colonial history of what fetishization is, is a way to work maybe around into a positive space around fetish. Um, and that, that might be an interesting argument to try on. I can imagine some of the, the, the um, ways in which we could, we could get there. Um, yeah, so, so much. And, and I'm really so grateful. I'm deeply appreciative of, of, of these reactions. Uh, if, if you all want to, to come back with something else, the representation would be certainly cool. Aaron, you, you know better what time constraints we're working under and what, the, what other uh, questions yeah, might we, be circulating. Um, we don't have much time. We, we can take a uh, field one question. Okay. okay. Uh, we have a question from, uh, from uh, Maura Kersel, um, no. who thanks everyone for the very uh, interesting panel. And she would like to know if you, Glenn, or anyone else could comment on museum labels and how they speak for or silence things. Um, the things on display are ma mediated through the curator or label maker who works for the museum, introducing bias and authority that is communicated to the visitor. How does the thing transcend the label? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Morgan. And thanks so much for 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 coming. Um, and just to more directly, I really enjoyed the 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 um, object biography essay that that she wrote, and I recommend it to to others too. Um, so briefly, the Menil has a, a very particular attitude towards 
labeling, which I um, which I like a lot, which is absolutely minimalist. So for the Byzantine Things show, for instance, th there was really just if there's an artist, the title, year, materials, accession number. Well, actually, maybe not even accession number that I don't remember exactly. Um, in terms of historical setup for that show, and this is typical of most of the shows, there's very little wall text. Um, so Byzantine things in the show, I showed you the entry way to the, the exhibition briefly, that was the entirety of wall text. And in fact, I spent a lot of time in the show and I had a number of terrific conversations, one with, more, more than one, with visitors who actually didn't know it was a show about Byzantine art which didn't trouble me at all. Um, and it just opened up other kinds of questions about what they were, they were thinking. A lot of people circulating the exhibition had questions that they were, if there was someone like me or the guards, I would, I would frequently um, stop and talk to the guards too and ask what questions they were getting. There was a lot of conversation that was engendered simply because of the lack of expect, you know, the information that many visitors um, expect to find. And it's that that sense of ultimately that that sense of mutual interrogation that Mrs. Domenial um, said many times that the, the, the collection was intended to set up situations in which viewers and objects mutually interrogated one another. It's utopian, of course, um, it's a beautiful notion, but it also operates in some really meaningful ways with, and it's partly because you can't photograph and there's no text to distract you as you walk around. Um, I know Shannon Donato, you, you've both spent a lot of time in the Menil, a few of other um, aspects or, or Joe and, and um, Andrea, you know, other points about those impediments in museums. It'd be, I'd be really curious to hear more about it too. Well, I'd be happy to just share something briefly about that, which was an experience at a different museum um, that operates very differently from the Menil, but also has a, a very minimalist non-existent labeling system. And that is the State, um, the state Museum of Fine Arts in Tbilisi, particularly the Treasury, mm -hmm. um, which is full of Byzantine and Georgian objects, uh, particularly precious metalwork. These objects uh, are in a kind of, I don't want to say a Soviet museum style, but it is a very kind of um, grounded in Soviet approaches to art museum in which objects from different time periods of different uses um, are put together in display cases with no labeling. Um, and the purpose is to sort of create a kind of equity among these objects that they are not colored and the visitors um, well, ideally in the past, the visitor would not be uh, subject to the biases of kind of art historical narratives of, you know, decline, fall, coming back up and things like that. And um, now, however, you have to have a guide who brings you through that space and who tells you a kind of canned narrative um, about those objects. And so that takes away part of that experience of not really knowing entirely the context of what you're looking at and having to think about it critically um, and replaces it with this very generic um, approach that is in many ways informed by um, the current political state of the state of Georgia. Um, and so I do think that there was at one point an attempt to have these objects really speak for themselves and to create their own history in conjunction with objects that they may otherwise not be paired with. Um, and it's, I would be very intrigued to, if I could go back in time and see how that experiment would work because um, it's something that I don't think will last very long in this museum. Um, and it's already in the process of being done away with. And so I do think that there were attempts before the Menil collection or around the same time as the Menil collection um, through a different lens to create a space for objects to challenge the viewer. Okay, so anyone else have uh, final comments? Maybe you, Glenn, before we uh, say goodbye to everyone. Well, just, just to try to express my gratitude again to, to you, Aaron, and to Matt, um, to all of you um, who, who read the book so, so carefully and generously 
um, I'm really touched by that. Thank, thank you so much. So, okay, so at this point, uh, I want to thank you all, the panelists and the audience, uh, for the great discussion that we had here. Um, and thank you for joining us. Have a good day or good night. I'm going to share with you here um, links to our Facebook page and to our YouTube channel. This, um, this uh, session has been recorded and will shortly be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So you're all Welcome to come back and watch it again and again and again and uh, share it with your friends and colleagues. So, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So thank you. Bye bye. Bye again. Bye bye. Congratulations, Glenn. Congratulations, Glenn. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thanks, thank you, Glenn. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.